little bit about me. I'm Eric Boyd. I, uh, I'm wearing the CCB shirt, kind of like the nice conference shirt. Uh, I actually don't work for CCB. We are a partner with CCB. I work for a company called ResponsiveX. Uh, we help CCB with, uh, and their customers with things uh, like Microsoft Azure, uh, software development and, and data center migrations and that sort of thing. Uh, I also don't work for Microsoft, but you see a number of Microsoft kind of accolades here. I'm a five-time Azure MVP uh, with Microsoft. I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director. I spend a lot of time doing this sort of stuff. I speak at conferences all over the country, all over the world. Uh, I write when I have time, which isn't a lot, uh, but I write for a couple of online properties as well as I've written a book on uh, SQL Database in Azure. Uh, and I occasionally try to be social on Twitter, but again, that's, time doesn't always permit that either, so I'm probably anti-social on Twitter. But feel free to follow me on Twitter, reach out to me, uh, ask questions, that sort of thing, and, and I will try to engage and be social in that way. Now I say all that because I have a deep, sort of history in IT. Uh, I've been doing this for a couple of decades. I've managed large uh, IT groups for large uh, sort of global companies. I have run software companies. I now run a consultancy. I've also, I've been around the Azure game for a long time, since the very beginning in 2008. So any questions you may have, uh, I can relate to a lot of scenarios, because I've been in this game for a while. Uh, just briefly a little bit about what ResponseVex does with CCB. Uh, we help customers build mobile apps, web apps, enterprise software, migrate data centers to Microsoft Azure. There's always, in everything we do, a Microsoft Azure play or a public cloud play. Uh, we are an elite Azure partner with Microsoft. So over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to spend time talking about what the Microsoft Cloud is all about, what Azure is all about, uh, give you some scenarios to think about uh, adopting the Microsoft Cloud in your data center, and we're going to think about how we can get rid of servers in that process, or maybe not get rid of servers, maybe repurpose servers, um, but at least stop investing capital into servers as much as possible. I'll also contrast that and tell you that it's not for every scenario. Um, so what I'm not here to do is, is pitch that the Microsoft Cloud or any public cloud is the right solution for every scenario. It's just not. And we, we are a consultancy first before we're ever pitching products or solutions. So we're trying to help customers find the right solutions that make the most sense for their organizations. And I'm going to try to leave the last 15 minutes for questions. So definitely uh, keep those questions sort of building. But at any point, uh, as we're kind of talking through this, at any point, feel free to stop me. And if I'm not, if you're not tracking with me, or uh, if you want to ask some follow-up questions to something I'm talking about, feel, feel free to stop and ask those questions. So who in here uses the public cloud today in organizations. Okay. Who's, use, who's using Azure? A couple of folks, okay. Um, who uses Office 365? Yeah, that's, that's a great gateway into the public cloud, right? It's kind of get your toes in, get your feet wet, get comfortable with that whole public cloud space. Now why does the public cloud matter? It's pretty, pretty simple fundamentally. Uh, in IT, I know most of you, a lot of you may work in IT groups, uh, so this is not a knock on IT. This is the reality of IT. You guys probably feel this. In IT, it takes a while to do things, right? Our jobs in IT is to manage and make sure our environment is up and running to keep the business running. Uh, it is to ensure that environment's secure and well kind of taken care of. It's not necessarily innovation. And the business drives us towards innovation and we're saying we're just trying to keep things running, right? We don't have time for all of that. That's not what we tell the business, but that's what we're thinking, right? If we told them that, they'd find somebody else to do our jobs. Um, but that's what we're thinking. We're trying to just keep things running. And so we don't often have time to do all of these interesting projects that the business thinks of. And even if we did, it's gonna take some time. So by the time the CFO and, and the financial suite approves uh, purchases, we have to order hardware, we have to rack and stack servers in a data center, we have to config all of that, and we're talking about weeks, months, that sort of thing. Even if we're virtualized, it's still not an instant sort of process. Even if we have capacity in our data center, it still takes time. So the cloud becomes really attractive for the business as well as us, because we get to kind of get our hands out of it in some ways. We get to not be the bottleneck, and we get to focus on keeping things running, 
um, but let the business do things like get to market quickly by provisioning servers and resources in a public cloud on demand instantly. So instead of taking days, weeks, months to provision servers, it can be done in minutes and hours. We can scale. So you may have scenarios in your data center where you have X number of servers and that meets the demand most of the time, but you have peak usage that you really need 2X number of servers, you just don't have it. And so it's sluggish for your users. The performance is not good, you hear feedback from users asking for better performance and you just say, it's as good as it, as it gets, right? You're, you're hitting it at kind of the peak capacity that we have. When you think about the public cloud, we have, think about it like a rubber band. We have this elastic scale, this ability to just on demand crank it up and turn it down. So scale is a, is a two-way street. We want to be able to grow and shrink as needed. Now, that in and of itself isn't attractive until we get to the economics of it. In the public cloud, we pay for things based on consumption. We pay for what we really use. So if we only use a server for an hour, we pay for an hour. If we use it for 30 minutes, we pay for 30 minutes. If we use it for five minutes, we pay for five minutes. So now we're talking about pennies. And now you can think about things like workloads that you could scale out across a number of servers. So think about batch workloads that you're processing, processing, processing some data that you might be able to do faster and deliver faster to your business if you ran it across 10, 20, 100, 1,000 servers. And instead of taking 10 hours to do something on one server, you might be able to do it in <laughs> one hour on 10 servers and deliver faster to the business. The cost is the same. You're paying for resource usage instead of paying for capital investments in your data center. So these are reasons why it really matters. In addition, maybe you want to have data centers around the world. DR is a great example of this. I want to have not just my data center here in Wisconsin, but I want to have a data center on the East Coast or the West Coast to deal with disaster in the event that we have, I don't know what natural disaster we would have here in Wisconsin, but some natural disaster. What's, what would be Tornado. Tornadoes, yeah, maybe. I, I grew up in southern Missouri, and so we have tornadoes in southern Missouri, right? Um, here we have a, a tornado occasionally. Um, so whatever that may be, whatever that natural disaster is, maybe it's just a, an outage. Uh, maybe the Lee Energies thing doesn't work out one day, and uh, so we just have a power outage or something like that. So all sorts of scenarios. Maybe we want to get data close to our users. We want geo-replicated data centers around the world because we have users globally, and we can do that. And so Azure is really great in this area. They have more data centers around the world. I'll show you exactly. More regions and data centers around the world than both AWS and Google combined. Uh, there's 28 around the world, including things like countries like Australia and India, European data centers, Asian data centers. Anybody have requirements to do data centers in mainland China? Okay, so it doesn't really matter for you, but doing a data center in mainland China is a challenge. It's not even, even for a company like Microsoft. Uh, if you ever do stuff in mainland China, you may hear the, the phrase, the Great Firewall of China. Uh, and that is truly what it sounds like. Uh, we're talking about a firewall, think about a firewall wrapping around China and everything is censored and nothing is getting in or out unless China says it is. So you need a data center in mainland China to deal with that. Azure has those data centers. Now, Azure, I think of it in the enterprise in kind of three distinct kind of categories that kind of make it really what it is. It's enterprise grade. And what I mean by that is, if you're a Microsoft shop, if you have Windows servers, if you have Microsoft application servers, the same sort of technology you use on-premises in, in your data center on-prem, you get in the public cloud. The same sort of reliability that you would expect in your data center, you get in the public cloud. It's, Microsoft has always been and will continue to be heavily enterprise focused, and they understand your needs uh, in the enterprise they build out a public cloud in the same way. Hybrid, in addition to that enterprise sort of focus, 
we recognize that not everything is going to run in the public cloud. I think early on in the public cloud game, vendors were coming to market and approaching it with the move everything you have to the public cloud. That doesn't make any sense. Like you've already made investments in your data center. There are things that run better in your data center on specialized hardware. It doesn't make sense to move everything. But we have to have a way to kind of interoperate and work together. And so with Azure, we can build a hybrid sort of cloud scenario or environment that lets us bridge our network with the Azure public cloud. So there's services in Azure like virtual networks that let us build a VPN tunnel between our data center and the Microsoft public cloud. We could bridge it with an MPLS network so we have a dedicated uh, connection between the Azure data center and our data center, in which case the public cloud just becomes an extension of our data center. And then hyperscale, we talked about this a little bit, but if I need to kind of blast out to a thousand servers, I can do that. And I can shrink it back down to one. Uh, like that. And so Microsoft provides that with their 28 regions around the world. If you've had the opportunity to visit an Azure data center, it's impressive. Uh, hundreds of thousands of servers in what looks like a warehouse. Uh, you would never know it's a data center from the outside. It truly looks like uh, a warehouse. Uh, but hundreds of thousands of servers with very few employees managing it. Everything's automated. Uh, so Microsoft has figured out how to do data center. I want to blow through some slides and we've talked about these sort of things already. There is something else that's really important here. I've talked about this enterprise proven hybrid, hyperscale. When I talk about enterprise, I talk about Microsoft. I talk about Windows servers and Microsoft Focus. And while that's true, all of those things exist in Azure and Microsoft has built out Azure with that in mind. It's also embraced the world at large. Microsoft is a different Microsoft than ever before. Um, we're seeing this all the time. Microsoft uh, is embracing the world outside of Microsoft. Uh, if you saw the Build Microsoft Build conference announcements last week, they have partnered with Canonical, the, the Ubuntu company, and we are now getting a Bash shell, like native, inside of Windows 10. Um, so not just a Bash shell, like an entire Linux sort of, it's not a kernel, but a, an overlay uh, to Windows that I can use the same sort of Linux commands and tools that I love over on Linux inside of Windows. Like that's radical. Like that's a new, different Microsoft. In Azure, it's the same way. They're embracing tons of open source projects and companies. There's now support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux inside of Azure. There's Oracle support inside of Azure. Like Microsoft supports these as first class, uh, almost like Microsoft sort of services. So Azure is that sort of platform that gives you kind of the best of both worlds. And when it comes to productivity, I use the same things I use in my on-prem data center. I've developed with things like Visual Studio or Eclipse. I use tools like Chef and Puppet for infrastructure automation. I use PowerShell, that sort of thing. It's the same sort of familiar environment. I get to use the same productivity tools. And then I can do things like integrate with SaaS vendors. Things like Box, Salesforce, Dynamics CRM, Office 365. And then the big question that always comes up in every cloud discussion is security and compliance. <laughs> Who here has heavy security and compliance needs? What do we got, like HIPAA? I'm a bank, so. Oh, yeah. 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 These are fun ones, right? Uh, we deal with banks and financial institutions. Uh, compliance is important. Security is important. Microsoft and public cloud vendors in general uh, have the world's experts as it relates to things like security and compliance. I hate to kind of ever frame it up in a way that knocks uh, a company because that's not what I'm saying at all. But any company that's focus is not on technology and not on security. It's highly unlikely that you have experts in that area that are greater than a company like Microsoft or Amazon or Google. It's just the reality of it. That's their focus. That's, that's what they're doing is building these technology platforms. You know, we are banks. We are hospitals. We have to deal with those requirements. But that's not our business. 
And so in the Microsoft case, here's a, just a list of certifications, compliance certifications that exist. Um, security is a top priority for Microsoft. There's all sorts of things going on in the Azure data centers. In these data centers, it's not just Azure running. Alongside of that are services like Office 365, Windows Update, Xbox Live, all those sorts of services. So security is not just important for Microsoft to deliver that to us, it's important for them too. Uh, can you imagine a scenario where Windows Update got breached? Now, we've all received bad Windows updates, but they're not malicious, right? They just screw up our machine because there's bad stuff that just wasn't tested well. But can you imagine if an attack got into something like Windows Update and proliferated out to the billion uh, computers running Windows? What an attack that would be, right? Uh, Microsoft doesn't ever want that to happen, so security is a big focus for them. Now, there's nothing better than kind of social proof, right? So these are just some quick numbers of kind of the evidence behind industry embracing this sort of uh, innovation and technology. So Azure sees 90,000 new subscriptions a month. There are a million and a half SQL databases running in Microsoft Azure. Um, 1.5 trillion <coughs> messages are processed by the Azure IoT suite today. The storage transactions is just amazing to me. Uh, almost 800 trillion transactions per day against storage in Azure. So this is a big thing, it's not, it's not going away, there's lots of momentum in addition to uh, that sort of, those sort of numbers, we see the momentum behind who's using it. So 80% of the Fortune 500 is embracing the Microsoft Cloud, it's a real thing. They are getting advantage. They have tons and tons of resources dedicated to IT, right? We're talking about the largest companies in the world Tons of investment in technology, and they are still looking to the public cloud to gain further advantage uh, in, in optimizing their infrastructure. So when we think about just raw infrastructure in Azure, what are we talking about? There are a ton of services available. So if I just want to run a server or a virtual machine in Azure, there's a service for that. If I want to do VDI in Azure, I want to do virtual desktops, I want to stream apps to users, uh, thin clients, that sort of thing. There's a remote desktop services service in Azure called Remote App. Things like Azure Active Directory for identity with multi-factor authentication, uh, run book automation with Azure Automation, lots of services. If I want to just store data, there's storage services in Azure. Networking services we talked about, things like the MPLS network between our data center and Azure using Azure Express Route. DNS services, there's uh, DNS load balancing services, all sorts of services, even for us just thinking about raw infrastructure and storage and compute. Oftentimes we hear things like, but I have servers that are really, really big. Can you run those in Azure? And I can't scale it out horizontally. I can't run multiples of these on smaller servers. I need big servers. So over here on the right you see we have servers today in Azure with 32 cores and almost half a terabyte of RAM. There are new servers coming online that are GPU focused. If you have scenarios where you're doing heavy GPU loads, there's an in series of servers today uh, that are designed just for that. We have storage services designed for fast, uh, high throughput, low latency, uh, massive IOPS. So if you have large SANs today in your environment and you need that sort of uh, disk I.O. and throughput, and you can get 80,000 IOPS on a single VM today in Azure using premium storage. Now this hasn't always been the case. I don't want to paint the picture that this is always Azure. These are innovations that are coming all the time in Azure. These are you know, relatively new services in the last year, year and a half, uh, maybe two years in Azure that give us this sort of capability. Microsoft is focused on making sure that we can do what we need to do using their public cloud. You'll see on the right, uh, these G-series VMs that actually shouldn't be in there, I should have removed that. But the G-series VMs uh, are these large, massive VMs with 32 cores and half a terabyte of RAM. The name G-series came from Godzilla. That was the code name of Microsoft during development. So the Godzilla folks don't like Microsoft talking about it in that way. So that shouldn't be in there. Um, so they like money, of course, for Godzilla. 
Hmm. Now we were talking about it in the terms of VMs and just raw infrastructure, but there's also services. Let's say we don't even want to manage a VM. We just want to deploy a website to the public cloud and make it accessible to the world. Like who cares about managing a server? It doesn't make any sense to us, uh, for us, for our scenario. We just want to hand code to Azure and let it run. There's a service called App Service where we can do just that for web apps, mobile apps. Uh, we can build some really uh, interesting like, workflow integration apps with logic apps. Maybe we just want to expose a web API. And we can do that with API apps as well. So there's a lot of different services we can tap into to kind of build out our environment. And one of the most interesting services today that we see in Azure is Cortana Analytics Suite, or Cortana Intelligence Suite, as it's renamed us. Um, who does like machine learning, data science, big data sort of stuff? Anybody? Okay. This is like, the new hot, <coughs> sexy thing, uh, and it's in Azure. Who's using Windows 10? Do you have Cortana in Windows 10? It's like the intelligent personal assistant. Sometimes yes. turn it off right away. Turn it off right away. I was in a, I was in a session at Microsoft. Uh, and it was a Microsoft uh, product team member doing a session for a large group of folks. You know how you can say like, hey Cortana, and then it does something? But sometimes it thinks you said hey Cortana when you didn't, and so that's a problem. Well, it was one of those scenarios. He was just talking. Cortana thought he said hey Cortana, and English wasn't his first language, and so it also didn't recognize the next set of things that he said. And so it did a Bing search for a set of words that were pretty inappropriate. And fortunately, the Microsoft sort of uh, filters uh, blurred out everything that showed up in the Bing search, because Cortana just did it. It was up on the screen in front of all of us, that sort of thing. So it does have some challenges every now and then. However, the things behind Cortana Things like machine learning, big data, data science, these are things that are kind of changing the way we do things. Think about Amazon. You shop on Amazon, you're looking at a product, and you see a whole slew of products that are also interesting that Amazon's recommending you go check out. That's all machine learning, it's all data science. Or uh, let's think about credit score. Same sort of thing. Credit scores are all a data science, machine learning sort of predictive model. You may or may not default on a loan, but it's predicting whether you are trustworthy or, or a good gamble, basically. We have tons of these scenarios in our environment, whether it's sales and marketing or e-commerce, fraud detection, um, lots of these scenarios where we can tap into something like Cortana Analytics Suite, bring in a ton of data, and try to predict the future. And Cortana Intelligence Suite makes it, kind of democratizes this sort of uh, confusing big data space, machine learning space, and makes it accessible for pretty much everyone to build a, a big data machine learning model. So there's lots of ways to get started. Now, we think about kind of common scenarios, uh, ways to just really easily get started with the Microsoft Cloud. Office 365 is certainly a great start because we think about things that are commodity services first. There's really not a differentiator between company A and company B as it relates to email, right? Everything's well known in email. It doesn't matter if we're using Exchange Server on-prem or some other email service, it's a pretty commodity service. So moving to the cloud in Office 365 makes a lot of sense. Now, it's not necessarily for everyone. If you have terrible internet connectivity and you have lots of internal email and there's no way for you to get better internet connectivity and there are parts of the world that this is still a problem, then it may not make sense for you to move that to the cloud. Running Exchange on-prem may be the right solution for you. And that applies to sort of anything cloud. Bandwidth is certainly kind of a first check mark uh, on the checklist. Does it make sense to run this in the cloud or not? 
do we have bandwidth to support this? Can we get bandwidth to support this? If not, it's maybe not a right fit. But if you can, then things like development and testing in the cloud makes sense. So if you're building a new app or you're testing out a new application server, a new stack of servers, maybe it's, will this run on Windows Server 2016? Deploying that in Azure, you don't need any hardware on-prem to do that. You don't need to buy any new servers. You can just test out your apps in Azure on Windows Server 2016. In fact, there's an image right now in the gallery with the latest preview bits. So you can just kind of new that up and test it out and run your apps in Azure. You pay for what you use. So when you're done testing, you turn it off and you only pay for the minutes that you used. So this is a great scenario for thinking about the public cloud. What about just moving or running our entire data center in Azure? We have customers that do that. They just want to pick up all of their servers from their data center and run them in Azure. Oftentimes they're running in a colo today, so it's quite similar. Sometimes it's just DR. So they want to run an identical copy of things in Azure. Maybe they even have them powered down, but they just want to power them up if something goes wrong. Maybe they want to load balance across them. Those are all scenarios where running and moving your infrastructure to Azure makes sense. Now, what I would say is we don't advocate just moving your data center and your infrastructure to Azure because it's something cool and new and uh, you know, there's these economic benefits from it. If it's running today in your own data center and you have the capacity to deal with that, you already have the servers in place to do that, and you don't need those servers for anything else, just leave it like it is. Like wait for it's time to do something like a Windows Server upgrade, to rethink that. If you're running on Windows Server 2003 today and you're having to think about, do I need to buy new 64-bit hardware to support all of this, to upgrade this to something that's supported, or can I run this in the cloud? Those are catalysts for that conversation, for thinking about, can I just run this in the cloud? So anytime you're buying a server or thinking about buying a server, that's a good moment to stop and say, does this make sense to buy and spend capital on servers, or can we run this as operational expense in the cloud to pay for it over, over many, many months in an ongoing service expense? Storage. We are creating more data than ever before. Who's buying like storage arrays regularly to deal with the mass amounts of data we're generating? And we want to keep data more than ever before, too, because Back to that big data analytics, uh, machine learning sort of stuff, if we have tons of data, we might be able to make sense of it and do something really valuable with that data and potentially predict the future and increase profit or decrease costs, that sort of thing in our business. So we want to store data more than ever today <coughs> in our organizations. But we don't really want to buy more storage arrays. So Microsoft has a solution called a Store Simple SAN. There's third parties that provide similar solutions. It's not you're not just bound to the Microsoft Store Simple device. Most storage vendors provide this. So we tier storage already on SANs. Like we'll have SSDs and we'll tier it to SAS drives and we'll tier it to even slower drives. But now we can tier it to Azure. So we can take like a two terabyte physical SSD SAN tear it off to Azure and have hundreds of terabytes of storage in this scene. The SAN's intelligent enough to determine what's hot and cold, what's being used frequently and what's not, and move that off to Azure. We just talked to the SAN over SMB, and when something isn't physically located on the SAN, it will just go pull that for us from Azure and it's transparent to us. We don't care. We just get the files back. So that's one way to think about using the public cloud in your environment. Backups are great. Uh, we don't want to continue to store backups in our data center. In fact, there's advantages to storing them outside of our data center in something like Azure, because then we can geo-replicate them to multiple data centers for failure. There's all sorts of app scenarios. You can build mobile apps. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Mobile apps running on the cloud, and I can scale that. Web apps running on the cloud as well. And again, I can scale that. It's publicly accessible anyway. There's a, a benefit for us to get that out of our data center even. From a security perspective, getting the publicly accessible stuff out of our data center to reduce the surface area for attack makes a whole lot of sense. So we have customers that maybe build new customer portals 
and they just don't want to run it in their data center because of that public exposure. Identity. Most of us already have Active Directory servers in our data centers. But we want to do things like federate with third parties. We want to use, do single sign-on with things like Salesforce, Box.net, uh, all sorts of, of different providers, Office 365. That's a great scenario for both syncing with Azure Active Directory, using Azure Active Directory multi-factor authentication, um, getting analytics over logins using Azure Active Directory, but also we can just run an Active Directory Federation services environment. We can replicate Active Directory to Azure and build that public-facing Azure Active Directory services environment in Azure and not, again, open that up uh, for that service area of attack into our own data centers. Lots of advantages. Then we get to beasts like this. who run SharePoint servers in their data center. SharePoint server is like, it's a great product. It is a complex, just pain to manage or to provision. Because it is a multi-tier application that requires database servers, application servers, front-end servers, integrations with all sorts of things, and it's just a beast. It's even, back to that very first sort of item, dev test, if you have developers developing for SharePoint, it's even more painful for them because they're trying to go stand up these environments on their own like dev workstation, and that's just painful because they're running out of resources and that sort of thing. But these are great scenarios to take these complex multi-tier applications that maybe maybe they aren't tier one apps in your environment. So by moving them to the public cloud, by moving these apps to Azure, you can reclaim a whole stack of servers, like maybe even a, an entire rack of servers in your data center that you can then repurpose for other things that make more sense for tier one apps that you really need on-prem. There are all sorts of other services, like if I wanted to stream media, this is the way the Olympics gets streamed. So if I want to encode and stream media, I could do that with Azure Media Services. Uh, if I wanted to do that sort of big data analytics, I could do that as well as a great way to sort of get started. And then today, the hot buzzword is IoT, one of the hot buzzwords. Collecting tons and tons of data from sensors all over the place, doing something interesting with all that data. So if, you're, if you have IoT scenarios, doing that in the cloud makes a ton of sense because you can scale the storage and the compute kind of as needed to deal with that massive amount of data and massive amount of compute processing. So those are some scenarios that we see kind of with customers, things that we do regularly with customers, great ways to get started. What I would say is that it makes sense to follow sort of an agile process when thinking about using the public cloud. So we, we know that if we, have, don't, we have, if we have bandwidth issues or concerns, that's not a good fit. If it's running in our data center without any issues, we don't have any performance issues, scalability issues, we're not dealing with decommissioning old hardware, that sort of thing, just leave it alone, let it run. But when we have those issues of it's time to upgrade our OSs or the hardware is not performing, those are good times to think about the public cloud. So what I would say is, and envision what that project looks like. Start small, prioritize the things in that project. Uh, how do we kind of deliver this in small chunks to kind of test the water? Start with something small. <coughs> Don't start with the ambition to just move your data center to Azure because you want to get some experience there. You want to make sure that it's the right fit. So start with something small, maybe tier two, tier three apps. Develop it out, deploy it in Azure, uh, test it out. Get feedback. So from your own internal IT groups, from your users, is this working well? Can we manage this well? Does it make sense for us? And if this works, just keep following this loop. Go back, take off a bigger chunk, migrate it, test it. Does it work? Great. Kind of loop around it and uh, keep, keep going. But start with something small, get some wins, make sure it works, make sure it's the right fit. What this allows you to do as IT is start thinking and focusing at a higher level. So instead of worrying about you know, managing hardware in your data center, you're thinking about the data center at a higher level and you're managing services and applications, but you no longer have to worry about is a drive failing? 
for the Azure Data Center, the drive fails, it's going to just move you over to another cluster of servers that you don't even know, you don't even think about. It's not, it doesn't matter. You think about servers kind of in two ways. You think about them like pets or like cattle. And when we think about servers like pets, we are caring for those servers like a pet that we love and we are making sure that that thing just doesn't die. And that's often the way we think about it in our data centers, right? We, in some cases, we don't even want to turn off a server because we're not sure if it'll come back on, right? And then we have, you know, we have like Windows Server 2003 sort of nightmare. It's not supported, so we have to move it to something that is. We don't even know how to recreate that server anymore, right? And so that's how we're thinking about servers often in our data center as pets. When we start thinking about it in the public cloud context, we think about it like cat. We don't care anymore. We want to automate the deployments of that so that it can go on hardware all over the data center. We just don't really care anymore. Um, so that's a good distinction to think about when thinking about the public cloud. Not just the public cloud, but a way to rethink the way we think about our own data centers as well. So with that, I'll open up to some questions because we're running late. Yeah, so if you want to run some dev servers in Azure, what are some other, ser other, other services that are required to purchase in order to get other things on the So I want to just flip over to the Azure portal. It's a great question. So the question is, we want to run dev servers in Azure. Do we have to buy other services? Um, yeah, So this is, uh, for those that haven't seen Azure before, this is the Azure Management Portal. This is where you would go from a GUI to manage your Azure services. It is, it is as simple as this. So I'm going to go down to Virtual Machines. And I'm going to create a brand new VM. A server in Azure that I want to run my application. We'll see a whole list of predefined templates here that we can just kind of pick and choose from and deploy. In this case, I'm going to choose Windows Server. You'll see a whole list of Windows Server SKUs. So here's uh, Windows Server Core uh, with containers uh, for 2016. This is Tech Preview 4. This is a great way to kick the tires on 2016. I'm going to choose 2012 R2 though. And hit Create. It's going to ask me for a whole slew of things. It's actually a pretty simple list. And I'm going to configure things like, what's the name of this server? Demo VM2. What's a username? Azure Admin. This is going to be our local admin account for this server. And let's choose a resource group. A resource group is just a logical container of resources in Azure, so we can manage it at that at that level. There we go. And then what data center do I want to deploy in? So I mentioned earlier there's like 28 data centers around the world. Uh, so there's a whole list of data centers we can provision to. Click OK. It's going to ask me for some more things like how big of a VM do I want? Do I want one of those massive G series VMs? So I'm going to go through that wizard. Whenever I'm done configuring all of this, and I, I will have a server running in Azure. While that's running, all I pay for is the compute time that's running and the storage that those disks take. And that's it. So I turn it off, and all I would pay for is the storage for the disks. The storage is incredibly cheap, like pennies per gig. Uh, the compute time is a little more expensive, so if we look at a list of all of these. This is going to be estimated based on uh, a month. I'm going to scroll down and find A series VMs. That's kind of the entry point. So A1 is my first dedicated core. So a single CPU core with a gig and three quarters of RAM at $45 a month for that server. Now that's kind of estimated on a, on a full month. If I just ran it for a few hours, I would just pay the 
pennies for those few hours, basically. So to your question, in a dev environment, all I would pay for, I don't need to like have a bunch of different services. It's really, I would just pay for the compute time that I use and the storage that I use um, based on how much I use. So, yeah. You uh, had an initial agreement with Azure some point, a price point to become cost prohibitive. How difficult is it to switch from one to another vendor? And, and, and what's the compatibility of that transfer of, of data? So, great question. So, question is, like, how do I switch from one vendor to vendor? How difficult is it? Uh, what's the compatibility like from vendor to vendor? And the catalyst was pricing. Like, it gets too expensive. So what I would say is that, in general, overall, the public cloud vendors have pretty consistent pricing across the board. So you're not gonna make a move to another vendor based on price, because the pricing is pretty similar. In fact, they used to like race to the floor. They've stopped because they, I think they finally realized we were racing to the floor. Um, but one would cut prices, a couple of days later the other would match or cut prices beyond. And they would just keep going back and forth. Microsoft publicly came out and said, uh, we are going to, like, just so you all know, like we're gonna match Amazon and Google's prices every time. So if they cut prices, I think it was more like a, a sort of battle statement to those guys. Like, hey, just so you know, like we'll race you to the floor and we have tons of money to do so. Uh, so they stopped fighting that war. The question of like, how do we move? There's a couple of ways. What's happening behind the scenes here for these VMs? It's Hyper-V, a version of Hyper-V running these VMs. So there's a VHD format, a file that's being boot up, booted up. We can copy that VHD out of Azure and run it in our own data center. We can boot it up on Hyper-V. There's tools where we could convert that VHD to a VMDK and run it in VMware if we wanted to, or some other format. So we definitely have that sort of interoperability. Um, what I would say is when we think about cloud, when we think about new deployments and migrations to the cloud, we take a step back and we work with a customer to rethink how they provision VMs. When we do deployments of data centers, we don't ever want to see a server console. So I just worked on a project that we deployed an entire ADFS environment, Active Directory Federation Services environment. We had ARR servers on the very front end doing layer seven load balancing. We had uh, web location proxies, ADFS servers, Active Directory servers, that entire setup we never saw a server console, it was all automated. So you can use things like PowerShell DSC. Uh, in Azure, there's a language, if you will, for provisioning resources called Azure Resource Manager. And you read Azure Resource Manager templates to provision the servers themselves. Uh, and then using DSC, we can configure the servers inside the server at the OS level. So we do that with everything from SQL Server clusters. We never want to touch or see a server console or do anything manually. We want it all to be automated. When you get to that point, then you can move it to any data center. But once you're in the server, you're configuring everything automatically. Um, so that's what I would advocate, and then you have total portability. Um, and that's useful for DR scenarios, too. If I need to go spin up an entire environment for DR, I can do that because I already have that automated or dev test. If I want to go spin up a, a test environment that looks just like my production environment, I just run this, the same scripts and pass in a few different variables, and we just do that, so, yeah. Good question. Uh, so for, for pricing, just some more details on that. Um, when you say you're only paying for, for uh, computation time, is that just server on, server off? Yes. Okay. In this scenario, in, in the VM like server scenario, it's server on and off. Okay. So you're not paying for like uh, CPU clock ticks or anything like that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then for like for that price there, given there, that's like running 24/7 all month. 24/7 all month. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be that would be the most. Yes. Okay. It's actually Microsoft was really conservative here because the way I would do a 24/7 all month would be estimating at uh, 730 hours a month. What Microsoft did was estimated even higher. They took 31 days by 24 hours. I would take 365 divided by 12, which would get you 730. That's actually even a, a more conservative number. So that's the absolute maximum you'll pay for a month. Yeah. Is, is there a way to automate 
when it shuts on and or, uh, uh, turns on and shuts off? Absolutely. Uh, so there is a service in Azure called Azure Automation. It's run book automation. So I can, inside of Azure Automation, I can create a run book that has a PowerShell. I can run it on a schedule or base it off of events that are occurring. Uh, and so I could, we have customers who do this all the time, based on, you know, run this every hour, every 30 minutes, or every 15 minutes. If the time is this and this VM should be on, then turn it on. If it's after this, the VM should be off, turn it off. Um, so you can totally automate that. You could automate all sorts of things with Azure. Basically anything you could automate with Azure Automation inside uh, the Azure environment. So it's a really nice service to do that sort of stuff. Said, uh, Microsoft matching Azure and all them on a lot of pricing. I know AWS just started doing like a CPU credits, so if you're not utilizing your full CPU even though it's up, is Microsoft going for something like that or probably not? So now that I've heard, they do you know things like reserve pricing, right? So that you can say I'll commit to running this sure. and then I get a better deal. Uh, the reality is, uh, some vendors don't. Let's say there's a yeah. <laughs> so let's just think about what happens. So in this scenario, I have a Hyper-V host that runs a bunch of Hyper-V guests. Sure. I'm giving, not me, but Microsoft is giving customers, they're carving off chunks of that Hyper-V host for you. What you choose to do with it is up to you, yeah. but if you've carved it off and you've provisioned it, that's yours. Another vendor may say, I'll carve this off for you, and that's the max that you will get. But I may, you may actually be shared with others, and so then you potentially run into issues with density on a Hyper-V host or on a virtualization host, right? Sure. That's the only way it would ever make sense to give credit back or charge based on. <laughs> well, because AWS really sells like uh, you know based on the hour you can purchase, you know what that rate is for, yep. you know, and so uh, on that concept, I think they price that in. So if you're running, uh, you know, you're auto scaling your micros or whatever, yep. um, and you're not utilizing the CPU that you kind of agree to, they give you some credit back, essentially, to exactly. leverage that. Um, I haven't seen that for a microphone we've talked about. I just wanted yeah, to no. edit that way. Or I've not that. seen anything like that in Azure. So. Not that they won't. Yeah, sure. Because they are fiercely competing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's interesting, so I, you know, there's a couple ways to look at the cloud game. Gartner puts Microsoft in leader quadrants in every cloud quadrant. In fact, quadrants that Amazon doesn't even exist in the license. Yeah. Wait the or something. Yeah. So and now they're doing Linux. Well, kind of right. Yeah. So Amazon doesn't even show up in the platform as a service quadrant. Sure. And they really don't have a concrete offering there, a cohesive yeah. offering for yeah. right? Yeah. So I say that uh, because you know they are competing and there's a couple ways to look at the the, the companies and evaluate them. Certainly we can look at Gartner and what Gartner says and recommends. Forrester or whatever. Sure. Um, you can look at market share and current revenue, and you can look at growth trends. And so the trend line we see right now for Azure puts Azure at incredible growth way over everyone else. So I think it's just a matter of time before Microsoft just totally owns this space. Um, and that's their vision, right? Their strategy today is sure. they're going to 